Hi there, uh, this is Rod Lim. Uh, I'm happy to give the pediatric airway talk uh, for the participants in the airway course. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over uh, some of the relevant anatomical physiologic uh, differences in the pediatric population, uh, as well as uh, proper sizing, uh, a brief discussion around dosing, and a uh, conversation around approach to challenging patients. Why is this important? Um, the nature of pediatrics uh, means that the vast majority of sick patients you're going to see are going to be respiratory in nature, uh, with the vast majority being primarily a respiratory in, um, with uh, the other 20% being shock and primary cardiac. Um, why is this particularly challenging? We've all been uh, in situations where airway management is, is important, uh, and I think it's really important to acknowledge a, a few things. Um, the most important thing to remember, as the great Dr. Joubert would say, is the patient has the disease. Now, that's a young picture of Dr. Joubert, so uh, you might be confused. Um, the patient has the disease, not you, uh, so it's important to remember that. Um, and the most difficult aspect uh, of managing a pediatric uh, airway really is managing your own anxiety. Um, it's high stakes. You may be uncomfortable because of the number of times you've been involved uh, in it. Um, but it's, it's really, really important to just acknowledge that. Uh, take a second to uh, to prepare yourself. Uh, we have mental models and, and plans for us to approach this in a logical, systematic fashion. But remember, the principles are the same. The strategy and goals are the same. The medications are the same. The technique is similar. We think about the process before we act, and we use cognitive aids. So always be prepared, but remember... Discretion is often the better part of valor. Uh, we always say don't trade an advantage for a disadvantage. Uh, the patient, yes, may be sick in front of you, uh, but don't act um, without thinking. Unfortunately, um, kids are not uh, just little adults. There are differences. Um, so uh, we do need to approach uh, the airway uh, in, a, in a slightly different method of thinking. Um, so let's just uh, use a few examples to talk about the anatomic differences between the pediatric and uh, adult airway. So let's start with a case. Uh, it's a four-year-old male um, uh, presents to your emergency department. Uh, they've had a barky cough for two days now, uh, and their initial vitals are a heart rate of 136, respiratory rate of 46, a saturation of 88%, and they have obvious biphasic strider with very little air entry and a lot of work breathing. Um, how would we manage this? Uh, obviously, uh, our minds quickly uh, jump to uh, our differential. Uh, although this sounds very much like an upper airway um, uh, infectious process like croup, we do have to uh, consider uh, the possibility of a foreign body. Uh, there are very worrisome features. We've all seen lots of croup, and very few of us have seen patients requiring oxygen on croup. Uh, and this particular child has a, a, a tremendous work of breathing. So um, our plan, again, discretion. We're not going to rush either in our assessment in terms of to frighten the child. Uh, we're going to try to not intubate um, because of uh, the stakes involved. Um, but if we do have to intubate, we need a plan. So what is our plan? We need to think about our equipment. Uh, do we want to do this using direct or video? Um, we want to uh, have uh, probably both available if we have that in our, at our institution. Uh, AT tube uh, size, we're going to plan for a three and a half cuff tube. Uh, medications, in this, uh, in this case, um, we're going to consider ketamine uh, plus succinylcholine. Um, and we're going to have backups available, uh, you know, a crike kit, uh, whatever you have available in, in, in the department you work in, uh, backup, whether that's anesthesia or otolaryngology. Uh, in this particular patient, um, they received epinephrine with uh, minimal improvement. Um, Helox, Helox was tried. This was at another center. Uh, there was no improvement, and luckily the patient um, went to the operating room for intubation uh, and had a grade 4 airway obstruction, and they were actually only able to intubate with a 3ET three, uh, three tube. Um, so uh, I've been involved in a couple of cases like this in the past. Uh, if you're okay, you're not happy, but you're okay, really trying to get the backup that you would have at your institution um, available uh, in order to make a controlled um, airway um, um, success uh, is super important. Uh, this is not a kind of patient that you would, uh, you would be very happy about trying to uh, intubate. 
Um, that leads us to our first anatomic uh, point, which is uh, airway of, uh, of a child is obviously a smaller diameter. They're much more prone to edema and obstruction. And choice of tube size is a big issue. Uh, we usually say age over four plus four, um, but we need to obviously adjust by disease process and by, um, by our story. If we hear that uh, the child, for some reason, to have a smaller airway anatomically or because of a disease process, we need to take that into consideration. And the depth of, of ET tube insertion can be approximated by the uh, a formula H divided by 2 plus 12. It's super important to really uh, um, aim for first pass success. Um, this child would not tolerate multiple attempts uh, and uh, certainly any trauma associated with that. Let's just move on to a second case. Uh, this is a four-week-old uh, girl who's had a fever for a day associated with poor feeding uh, and presents to the emergency department with fever, lethargy. Um, during this time, a full septic workup is done. They're on antibiotics, uh, but unfortunately, someone notices that the child is now apneic and they're brought to the resuscitation room. So what's going on here? Um, you know, is this uh, a real apnea? Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, especially if uh, people are not used to children, uh, periodic breathing can be appear like apnea. Uh, does it require stimulation? Are they self-resolving? Um, are there bradycardias associated with it, uh, with these desaturations? So these are all things to consider in terms of your differential. Uh, in this case, our plan is to move to uh, to uh, assist breathing during these apnea spells. Uh, and and uh, if these are recurring, uh, which they usually are, uh, we need a plan to secure the airway. So what's our airway plan, equipment-wise? Uh, really, um, uh, we're going to uh, opt for a direct um, intubation technique, and the discussion is around uh, use choice of blade, a Mac or a Miller blade. So this leads us to our second anatomic point, uh, that young children have a long, floppy, narrow epiglottis, uh, and we can choose equipment that can help um, optimize our success. So um, you may be used to the Mac curve blade, um, but obviously in, in pediatrics we have availability, uh, um, ready availability to many sizes of Miller braid, blades, which are straight, as you can see on the image on the right. The Miller straight blade uh, is uh, inserted in the same um, same method, except uh, the length of it and the and the and the non curvature of it allows us to pick up the epiglottis, um, which uh, can optimize our view. So it's better for infants and toddlers uh, who have a floppy uh, epiglottis. Um, versus the Mac curve blade really is placed in the vlecula, uh, and as we lift the the epiglottis uh, comes up with it. Uh, and it's better with uh, children with uh, with a traditional kind of more stiff epiglottis that we that you may be more uh, used to. Really, at the end of the day, um, um, you will likely be successful with either blade that you choose, and sometimes it comes down to comfort. Uh, I will switch between blades depending on the age and the and disease process, uh, but at the end of the day, you need to be comfortable um, and be aware of the uh, uh, choice of equipment uh, if your first choice uh, isn't working and what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of either. So in this case, moving forward, we have an airway plan. We've talked a little bit about Mac versus Miller. We uh, may consider a video uh, laryngoscopy if it's available. Uh, we want uh, ET tube sizes available, uh, at one um, our choice and one below. Um, and again, for medications, uh, there's a lot of uh, considerations you can use, um, but really uh, it's more important that you use something uh, at the right doses um, and that you're comfortable with, and we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit. Um, in terms of uh, backups, uh, part of your airway plan is, is if it doesn't go well, um, what is your plan? So here's a picture of, uh, of the airway. Unfortunately, this child, uh, we see the big uh, epiglottis, but we can't see much else beyond that. Um, uh, w you know, what do we do? So what can we change? Um, and this is a pretty common um, phenomenon when we first look at uh, pediatric airway. You may look in and all you see is, you may see nothing, you may see part of the epiglottis, um, uh, or you might uh, see everything that you wanna see. Um, but that's pretty common, uh, especially the younger the child, especially being very floppy or whatnot. So how can we approach this? So this leads us to uh, the third uh, anatomic um, highlight is that the anterior and higher larynx is common in, in pediatrics. Uh, and proper positioning and cricoid pressure can dramatically change uh, your view. So um, very, very important uh, is to just take a step back, just kind of like uh, if you think about uh, a PA algorithm or whatnot, just don't panic. Take a step back and make sure that everything is the way that you want it. Is the child properly positioned? Are they in the midline position? 
Um, do you have a, a assistance that can help uh, provide uh, cricoid pressure that you can direct? Uh, it's amazing how much you can optimize your view with, uh, for, with cricoid pressure, uh, as you can see in these pictures here. Remember that uh, children, in terms of their positioning, uh, you can kind of cause a lot of trouble for yourself. Uh, so we often talk about a shoulder roll in an infant uh, to try to place that uh, um, a chin and, and chest uh, into the proper position. And as the child gets older, then we start to talk about the uh, hyper uh, extension of the, of the neck. But in very young children, the shoulder roll can be uh, uh, really, really important. Um, one other anatomic uh, difference is, uh, relatively speaking, the tongue is quite large, um, especially uh, when we sedate the child uh, or the child is, is already under the effects of some hypoxia or for CNS dysfunction, and this can lead to obstruction uh, and the need for, uh, for uh, sometimes a larger blade or uh, an oral airway. Uh, one of the best examples is uh, uh, neuro patients or patients with uh, seizure disorders or uh, sometimes effects of anticonvulsants where they can get uh, macroglossia. Uh, another anatomic difference that's important to highlight is the narrowest portion is subglottic. Um, so this does uh, lead us to talk about uh, the use of cuffed and uncuffed tubes. Um, obviously, uh, the uh, um, use of cuffed tubes in adults, uh, as you get younger, uh, there's a lot of discussion around uncuffed tubes. There's a lot of um, variation in the past few years in terms of when to use cuffed and uncuffed tubes. Um, really, it's probably not that important, to be honest with you. I think the most important thing is to just to be aware. Um, and you can always put a cuff tube in and not inflate it. Um, so sometimes we always say if you're anticipating high pressures that are going to be required, like if you're anticipating, uh, God forbid, an asthmatic, um, you want to be able to, to reduce any leak that's present. Um, so um, this has changed a lot over the past few years. Um, in the end of the day, you put in what, what's, what you're comfortable with. Um, and uh, again, um, you don't have to inflate the cuff if you, even if you put a cuff tube in. Uh, next slide is uh, the, in terms of the appearance of the glottis, it is much more pink in, in appearance, uh, as you can see in the pictures on your, on, your, uh, on your left. These are kids of different ages. Uh, the younger the patient, the more pink the cords uh, can sometimes look, and they can be difficult uh, to recognize if it's something that you haven't uh, uh, seen before. Those are all very good views uh, with your uh, cricket pr uh, pressure. Uh, you'd be very happy to see them, but obviously it does look a little bit different by age. So just to, to summarize uh, the key anatomic differences uh, in pediatric versus adults, um, there's a shorter and smaller diameter that's uh, prone to edema um, uh, and obstruction. Uh, they have a more anterior and higher larynx. They have a long, floppy, narrow epiglottis, a larger occiput and tongue uh, by age, and the narrowest portion of the airway is subglottic, and they have relatively more pink uh, vocal cords. So that's the anatomic differences. Uh, that's the first part. Um, let's just move on to some physiologic differences. We'll start with a case, a three-week-old uh, baby who has had some poor feeding since birth, some slow weight gain, and presents to the emergency department with uh, 100 grams below, sorry, 100 grams above birth weight, uh, pale, hypotonic, and with some bradypnea apneas requiring bag valve mass uh, ventilation. Their heart rate's 188. Uh, unfortunately, they're apneic at this time with a low respiratory rate. Um, we're going to move on to, uh, to our airway plan. So we're going to look for a, a video if it's available or direct. Uh, we're going to choose a Miller blade, that's this, um, again, straight blade that we discussed before. And we're going to have two ET2 sizes available, a 4 and a 3.5 ET2. We're going to think about medications uh, and uh, um, uh, our choice of medication and what are some of the potential uh, problems that we're going to talk about. Um, in this kind of child, especially if they've been apneic in the past or whatnot, um, you know, we're going to be thinking about the complications of desaturation um, and, and vagal response because of the age. Big physiologic differences is they have a higher metabolic rate and a shorter time to desaturation. Um, you know, uh, these are the kind of patients you really want to make sure they have a good apneic oxygenation and a good uh, BVM prior to attempt in order to uh, maximize your time prior to desaturation. Unfortunately, these kids, uh, even with... Uh, uh, prudent use of these methods, they can still desaturate within seconds of your uh, initial attempt. Uh, so don't be surprised uh, if that happens. 
we talk about vagal tone, especially in children under two, but especially in babies, um, that we want to blunt that initial vagal tone with uh, airway manipulation. Uh, and there's been some controversy as to uh, atropine being used or not used. The new guidelines have removed the use of atropine from a pre-medication, uh, but it's something to be aware of and you can be used at your discretion. Um, in terms of uh, medication choices as to, to optimize as well, which we'll discuss. So what do I do? What dose do I use? Um, here's a list of medications. Um, you know, a good rule in general, if you're suddenly panic and you forget everything that uh, you've ever been taught about pediatrics is think of every adult as a 50 kilo ch child. And if you think of your adult um, intubation medication um, um, formulary, you divide it by 50, it's going to be in the rough ballpark of what you need to do. So you know you're not off by a factor of 10 or a factor of whatnot. So that's a good starting point. Um, we're going to uh, look at, at higher doses uh, as induction agents, so ketamine 2 per kilo, propofol 2 per kilo, fentanyl 2 per kilo, uh, and our paralytics of succinylcholine and rocuronium at 1 per kilo. Uh, there's lots and lots of cognitive aids and resources that are available. Uh, it's super important, no matter where you go, to just be aware of, of uh, prior to a sick patient arriving, where everything is kept, what aids are available at the place that you're working, um, and what kind of um, uh, aids that you prefer to use and, and whether that's going to be readily available. Uh, it's always difficult to find these aids when you're in the situation. These are things you should be aware of prior to um, a sick patient arriving, especially for special populations like pediatrics. Um, so these aids can help with equipment and sizing. They can also help with medication and dosing. The most common one that you're probably familiar with is the Broslow tape. It's a length-based resuscitation tape um, that can be easily utilized. You put uh, one at, at the tip of the head, you bring it to the feet, and it's going to give you a color, as uh, shown here. Uh, we don't wear those uh, tops anymore, um, but anyway. Um, so uh, in this patient is, is showing on the white uh, strip there. You can see the tip of the feet are at white. Um, and then there's a medication card. And on the tape itself, we'll tell you the equipment that you need and the approximate medication doses. Um, there are also fancier systems that have drawers uh, that correspond to these colors that you can just pull the drawer out and everything you need will be in that drawer. So um, that's, uh, that's one base system. There's lots of others. You can use this handy dandy, very attractive card that a genius must have made. I'm just kidding. Uh, this is the drug card that we have at Pediatrics that I made. Um, but uh, there's lots of cards like this. Um, but basically, some kind of memory aid um, or app that you can use. Um, the most common uh, app um, is uh, uh, <laughs> the one from Australia. Um, uh, it will come to me in a second. That's a part, part of my age here. Um, here is a, another one that is uh, uh, an intubation checklist. These are all good. Uh, 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 they're all good um, uh, uses. This, instead of medications and dosing, really is around um, uh, you know a good intubation checklist. Uh, lots of institutions have have to various assesses, uh, thought about having a checklist, but it's a really good idea in terms of to uh, to aid. Uh, a lot of the times when things go wrong, it's because something wasn't checked ahead of time. So uh, whether you use a checklist or not, um, uh, you you need to kind of think this uh, through um, ahead of time. Um, so know where to find things. This is a, a, a picture of a, of a Breslow cart, um, but if you don't have a Breslow cart in your institution, um, uh, it's important to know uh, where all your pediatric uh, equipment is held. Um, so whether it's in a pediatric box like the top, this is the big red box, is pediatric on it, or whether it's a specific location in your resuscitation room. Um, uh, neonatology requires a whole separate sizes uh, and, and things that are unique to it. Where do you keep that, etc. So really important to know where to find it uh, and to be able to find it quickly when you need it. Just a, a few, next few slides, just on some other considerations, special situations. Um, so we'll talk quickly about a four-day-old boy who has some poor feeding, presents to emerge with some cyanosis and an O2 saturation of 87%. Uh, again, thinking about what could be going on, uh, we, we need a, um, an airway plan um, uh, in terms of uh, to manage uh, the cyanotic patient. Um, you know, we need to think about time to saturation, the vagal response and the age, the risk of precipitating arrest if we don't uh, manage uh, complications that can occur, uh, and what medications and paralysis agents that we're going to choose. So um, again, equipment, meds, potential problems. Um, in cardiac patients, patients uh, with, with unknown or known cardiac disease, these can be incredibly uh, challenging. Um, Ductal dependent lesions, so lesions that uh, that require the duct to remain open, usually presenting in the first few weeks of life, either related to um, 
to uh, kind of blue type uh, children who have like, uh, you know, all the T's like truncus or, or tetralogy de flow or uh, tricuspid atresia. Those are all ductal dependent uh, cardiac lesions or gray type obstructive lesions like hypoplastic left heart, uh, critical aortic stenosis, um, um, uh, coarctation of the aorta critical. Uh, those are all uh, things that can be PG dependent. They can present in, in numerous ways. They can present as a shocky patient or a patient who's uh, or cyanotic. Um, these are extremely high risk patients to intubate. Uh, we always say um, you definitely want to go for first pass success, most experienced, um, because um, medications can significantly uh, change the um, dynamics of blood flow uh, and can uh, these patients are at high high risk of arrest. Um, so we definitely want to be pre-medicating to take the vagal uh, tone uh, issue away. We may be um, uh, le using medications lightly because of the cardiac depressant effects. Uh, we may uh, be uh, nervous about paralyzing, but certainly I would advocate for paralysis. Um, and again, having uh, resuscitative doses around uh, in case uh, you uh, you do uh, unfortunately uh, lead to cardiac arrest uh, is probably a good uh, thinking ahead of time. Uh, again, these are very, very challenging patients, and I would, uh, much like thinking you shouldn't intubate an asthmatic, you should be extremely nervous about this uh, specific population. Another uh, common um, challenging patient it, are, pa are patients with Down syndrome or trisomy 21. Uh, they can be notoriously difficult intubations because of the anatomic uh, variations. Uh, they're very hypotonic, have extremely large tongue. There is the risk of atlantoaxial instability. Uh, and uh, normal maneuvers that you would normally use may uh, not aid in the visualization of the airway. Uh, you should consider uh, video uh, laryngoscopy if you have it available at your site, uh, probably choosing a large blade or potentially a, a Miller blade um, so you can uh, control more of the um, structures that you see um, uh, to, to try to optimize your view are all things you need to consider when, uh, when dealing with these patients. There are many other types of um, anatomic uh, patients that are in the pediatric population, other, whether they're either trisomies, patients with a cleft lip or palate or pure Robin sequence, patients with cerebral palsy or, or, or some neurologic um, um, uh, atrophy um, uh, related to uh, hemiplegia. Uh, these are all challenging patients that we need to, uh, to consider. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't take those kind of patients lightly uh, in terms of your pre-likelihood uh, of uh, success of intubation. Um, again, you know, don't turn a good situation into a, into a worse situation or a bad situation into a worse situation. So be extremely cautious if you would predict. If you look at the patient, you predict because of micronathia or the facial features that this is going to be a difficult intubation. Uh, you're going to try to ask for help and have the, the uh, most experienced people there in case you run into problems during intubation. Uh, just a quick slide, uh, just saying there are lots of non-invasive ventilation uh, things that are available in pediatrics, whether it's BiPAP, CPAP, or, or we're using uh, lots and lots of high-flow nasal cannula. They can bail you out in, in patients that are having trouble, have uh, ex you know uh, lots of work of breathing, and we try these uh, techniques, uh, which can buy us some time uh, to get the most experienced person uh, available, buy us uh, some stability for transport, uh, and potentially uh, prevent us from needing to go to intubation. Um, so these are all things that should be considered, and again, uh, depending on what's available um, at your institution. So, uh, you know, if things were to go uh, astray, it's important to have a mind map consideration uh, in, in pediatrics, whether that's uh, continue to bag uh, malvas the patient, uh, the use of LMAs, uh, we talked a lot about video laryngoscopy, the use of a bougie to optimize uh, first-pass first success uh, and visualization, uh, and having some form of needle crick uh, available to you uh, or a surgical um, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, scalpel finger bougie uh, type setup. Um, regardless, you need to have kind of a, a, a progression in your mind of, uh, of what you're going to do if things are not going uh, in terms of your first or second um, uh, um, um, airway plan. Um, so, you know, we talk about the, the question that often comes up is uh, rows and states, uh, not to uh, correct someone below the age of eight years of age, um, but all the pediatricians uh, that take care of young children um, re say, really, if you're in that situation, you really don't have uh, much uh, options at play. Again, um, uh, this is uh, when we're thinking of judicious use of uh, uh, requiring intubation. This is not about uh, um, um, being um, cowboyish about it, but if you run into a patient where they're going to die if they don't have a surgical airway, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to not listen to Rosen's this time. So I would certainly suggest you go ahead and, and obtain an airway. Um, 
So that, uh, that comes to a conclusion, uh, this uh, uh, recorded lecture. I hope this was useful to you, but uh, we're excited to see you at the conference, uh, and uh, um, we'll be happy to answer your questions and work through some cases at that time. Thank you very much.